Good morning, Mr. Brooks. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court, I'm Stephen Brooks. I represent Aaron Thomas in this case. What I intend to argue, Your Honors, is uh, the second part of the brief, which uh, unfortunately for me are the unpreserved issues uh, in this case, and Ms. O'Brien would argue the, uh, the search and seizure matter. Um, the first issue, Your Honors, is the issue of the joint venture statements that came in in connection with the trial. Our contention is that there was insufficient evidence of a joint venture independent of uh, the actual statements that were made by uh, Mr. Garofalo to Trooper Babin, uh, excuse me, Trooper Babin, uh, during the course of the two undercover buys that were the subject of the trial. We're really only talking about the April 18th ish, uh, episode, aren't we, with regard to that? Because on March 27th, that incident, he, Thomas is charged as a principal, or at least the jury got it as principal liability. That's Am correct. Right? That was the instruction that was given by the court, yeah. which was a claim of error. So the joint, um, the conspiracy stuff, I know it permeates the whole trial, but really if goes more or less to the April 18th issue, the April 18th episode. Well, with the April 18th episode, what we have is Mr. Thomas coming in to a small back room at the first bar, right. coming out, uh, and Mr. Garofalo going back and coming out and making the exchange with Trooper Babin. Um, the more significant statements that actually inculpate my client uh, and Ms. O'Brien's client are uh, the statements made by Mr. Garofalo stating that he needed to meet his suppliers. So if it right. doesn't directly affect Mr. Thomas, it certainly I can speak to the okay. issue with respect yeah. to Mr. Washington. Yeah. Guys, he used the word guys, which is uh, more than one. Guys, yeah. yes. And how uh, did his statements come into evidence, Mr. Garofalo's? I'm sorry, Your Honor? How did Mr. Garofalo's statements, these are the ones that you say should not have been admitted, because there was no, there had been no conspiracy established upon which they should have been admitted. That's correct. So they came in as hearsay statements. How did they come in? They came in through the course of Trooper Babin's testimony. There was no objection made uh, by the attorneys. So they came in direct examination of Trooper, Trooper Babin? They, were, they came in, in direct, and uh, in fact, they were also uh, mentioned on cross when the issue was explored by uh, defense counsel, they were, they were also the subject of cross-examination. So they, they did come in the front door and the back door. So it comes in for all purposes. I mean, this is That's pretty correct. typical. Counsel all the time lets hearsay in if, it, if he wants to use it on cross-examination or for any other reason. Perhaps, but the, the main issue here is that there was, no, there was no limiting instruction given to the jury. But was not, none was asked for. That's correct. That's correct. So you're um, in a risk of a miscarriage situation. But there seems to be a lot of evidence that these people knew each other, Thomas, Washington. You know, they're in both... They're at the bars, both bars. And, well, that they you know, knew each going other. going back and forth. Um, Garofalo in April spoke with Washington just before the drug deal. Thomas walked out, walked out of the bathroom where apparently the drugs were exchanged with Garofalo. Well, didn't Mr. Stuff. Washington work at the bar? There was testimony First by the bar. defense. There's, that a there's a founding by the judge that he worked. That he, that he was employed by the bar, by the second Well, one bar. of the bars. At not the, the not both bars, but the at second the bar. And that, that was part of his explanation uh, that dovetails somewhat into the search and seizure argument. When the money was seized from Mr. Washington, uh, there was the $2,400 right. um, amount that was seized from Mr. Washington, and his explanation was that it was money from the bar. Uh, apparently didn't go too far with the jury, but that's uh, his explanation. Didn't quite make it. <laughs> um, well, why isn't it a statement of identification? A non-hearsay statement. My supplier will be coming in a minute. Well, then that would be a hearsay purpose. So, it, but but, it, but it's a non-hearsay statement. It's a it's a statement of identification. It's 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 a it's an act. Well, I would suggest that if if Mr. Garofalo had stated, my supplier, Mr. Washington, or my supplier, Mr. Thomas, or my supplier, Mr. Jones, is here and the police were able to identify them later as those people, sure. But my suggestion is that the statement was, I have to meet my suppliers, certainly very compelling evidence of guilt in this case if it's admitted properly, um, but without the further step of actually identifying them individually, then you don't have the statement of identification. You simply have a statement of, I have to meet my suppliers. Um, in the cases that have dealt with this, the court has always found, the court has always been dealing with more substantial evidence that's independent of the actual statement itself. 
when considering the joint venture. I, I take it in addition to not requesting an instruction, whoever trial lawyer was, uh, also didn't object when the so-called conspirator statements were being put in. Didn't object. Or there was no objection during the course of. Okay. Uh, the so admission. the Commonwealth never said we're putting, we're offering this evidence as statements of a co-conspirator. It was never offered that way. It was just came out in testimony and testimony cross-examined. No objections. Yeah, rolled out seamlessly, and nobody was even thought about it. There was no objection, and as so far the, as I know, there was no. So is the judge or, supposed to say, "Okay, there's been no objection to this"? The Commonwealth says it hasn't said it's offering it for this very specific purpose. How could this come in if there were an objection? Oh, this might be a co-conspirator statement. So, I mean, is the judge supposed to do all this in his mind and then sua sponte say, oh, hold on, let's stop right here? Well, I don't think it's too much to ask for the court to make an instruction on co-conspirator statements. It's asked. But it's asked. They weren't offered as co-conspirator statements. They weren't offered that way. They just came in in testimony. Well, they, they weren't offered specifically earmarked as co-conspirator statements. That seems to, we're all operating under the assumption that that's just, the purpose. How does the judge know what the defendant's strategy is? If the, de if the judge went through the mental process that Justice Cordy just described, couldn't the judge very well say, well, it's not my responsibility because maybe this is the defendant's strategy, and I can't interfere with it now and give a... First of all, he would have to ask the defense counsel if he or she wanted this because maybe... Maybe he or she wants it for a very strategic reason. I don't know what it is. The judge has no idea what the tactics are of the defense counsel. Not necessarily, but certainly it's, it's typically our practice to try to exclude as much evidence as possible as defense attorneys. Once in a while things get by. Um, twice in a while they get by. But in this case, what we're suggesting is that it satisfies the Freeman standard. Also, when you couple it with the failure to instruct a jury as to the use of the statements, uh, but they can't be, you, you, but once it's admitted for all purposes, there can't be a failure to instruct its limitation, to instruct on its limitation. It isn't limited. Mm. You've got a tough road to hoe. I think you know that. We appreciate your coming up to bat first. <laughs> <It's tough>. <laughs> <laughs> if you run out of rotten vegetables. At least you didn't try to bunt. <laughs> <laughs> thank uh, you very much, thank you, uh, Mr. Brooks, Mr. O'Brien. <laughs> Good morning, Your Honors. Leslie O'Brien for Mr. Washington. May it please the Court. Uh, as you know, the, the defendant filed a, a motion to suppress in this case based on the, uh, a traffic stop. And the, uh, this was a situation where it was essentially not contested that there was a legitimate traffic stop. That was not contested at the hearing. It was not contested that there was... Uh, uh, a basis for a Terry stop, or a reasonable articulation for a, a, a Terry stop. But what was contested was that the officer had the, uh, had the right to have the uh, occupants of the car step out of the car and also the right to pat. Let's Mr. take Washington. the first one. Um, I, I, in my sense is that we shouldn't even, th whether it's a traffic stop or not is, is quite irrelevant. This is a Terry stop. Whether the person's in a car when a Terry stop occurs or on a bicycle or walking down the street, this is a Terry stop, right? At the end of the day, well, it's, it's not a traffic stop. It's a Terry stop. Well, it's, it was treated as both, but yes, okay. it's a Terry but stop. But the analysis for your purposes is that this is a Terry stop. Yes. So if someone is in a car and the officer has a basis to go over and ask them some questions, a Terry stop, reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed, by this individual. Can't the officer say, could you please step out of the car, sir? That's a stop. That's a seizure. But it's a Terry seizure. Well, the court, step out uh, of the car so I can ask you some that questions. That would be a change in the law because the court has so, so far found that the, under uh, Vasquez is one of the more recent cases dealing with that, that there must be a suspicion. No, that's a, a traffic stop. That's a tra that's why I'm trying to, yeah, that's a traffic I'm, stop. If you're I'm stopped for a violation. Vasquez is not, a, most respectfully, it's okay, not Okay, tell, tell me about stop. Vasquez. In, in Vasquez, Your Honor, there was a, a report of, of a shooting where when the a shooting, or not a shooting, but an assault, where the officer and a report of a gun, the officer arrived on the scene, the suspect was standing near a gray Mazda, the, the suspect didn't leave, but the gray Mazda left, and the, uh, when the officer caught up with the gray Mazda in which there were, there were two women seated and invited them or asked them to get out of the car, the court analyzed that as there was su sufficient indication of danger there to justify the leaving but, but of the car. But this is really... And so far, the court has, has that... But this has is not... Okay, so you're saying this, is, this should be treated as a motor vehicle stop, 
And so whether you can ask someone to get out of the car depends upon reasonable suspicion that they've committed some crime. Well, I'm saying that the, if, here, the court is, here. if the court is going to be consistent with the, with the holdings of the court up until the date of this stop, no, yes, absolutely. No, 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 not really. This, this whole thing is different. It's not a Terry stop. It's part of a broad investigation about these folks being drug dealers. They had plenty of probable cause to arrest them when they stopped them because this was in April after the last incident. They could have arrested them, wouldn't you agree, for dealing in I, drugs? I, I, if you I can arrest agree. somebody for dealing in drugs, you can certainly ask them to get out of the car and pat them down. I don't agree that there was probable cause for, for arrest at that point, Your Honor, because if you, if you recall, all of the, anything that could amount to probable cause in this case came from the, the middleman, Garofalo. His actions and his words about the defendants would have provided the probable well, cause. Well, yes, and plus Garofalo. a whole bunch of direct observations by the trooper in the, when he was in those bars. But going Garofalo, back to the poker room, going into the bathroom, coming out with the drugs, these guys talking with each other, reference to suppliers. Certainly, plural. Your Honor, but the, the trooper Babin specifically stated that Garofalo had reason to want to misdirect him as to whom the, the, uh, the supplier was because Garofalo wanted to ma maintain his status as the middleman. Well, let me uh, put it this way. If we, if we disagree with you and if we find that there's enough probable cause on April 18th to have arrested these two people, then Terry, would you agree, Terry, car stops, all that stuff are out the window. We don't need it. Well, uh, I don't think it's exactly out the window because you still need some exception there that would allow what the, what the police officers did based on probable cause. And if there, if there is probable cause and an arrest, clearly you have a search incident to arrest and everything that goes along with that. If you have probable cause plus exigent circumstances, or and this court I don't believe has ever ruled on this, on this in particular, but the, the trial judge did cite Commonwealth versus SKEA, S-K-E-A, and, uh, and uh, in that case the court held that probable cause plus an e exigent need to, a probable cause for the search, plus an e exigent need to preserve evidence would be sufficient. This court hasn't specifically addressed that. Was there any but evidence? that's not this case. Was there any it, evidence in this case that, that the police had reason to believe, had probable cause to believe, that Thomas and Washington still had some drugs on them? They, uh, well, the, whether or not they believed that, they specifically... No, did they, did they have probable cause to believe did they have that Thomas and Washington still had some drugs on them? I don't see where that probable cause w would come from. But even if it did, and if, even if you wanted to go with the skia, probable cause plus exigency <coughs> type exception, even if the court wanted to accept that as an exception. This is a case where Babin said what we had here was, was a by walk. We... We didn't seize that money because um, we didn't seize the money because that was that would have interfered with what we were doing. They didn't try to seize the, the drugs that were inside the car. They uh, th this was not exigent circumstances plus the need of the police to preserve evidence. If it was something along those lines, certainly the prosecution, which had the burden of proof. Certainly they had some obligation to present evidence. This is what we were doing. They never presented any such evidence. They never put on the stand the police officers who ordered the, the men out of the, the, the car. So that, um, so that it doesn't fall within the ski exception, even if the court would disagree with well, me and all say these cases there's are, probable cause. Well, are fact-specific, and it seems here there's a very unique, uh, unique fact pattern. Exactly. Because they're pursuing an investigatory technique, which doesn't seem unreasonable to me, and that is um, let's stop these guys, see what we can find out, and, you know, we're going to follow this chain of supply up to see if we can get a little bit further. Because they let them go, right? They let them go. And what they, and what they said was, and the only testimony was that, that was offered was, we wanted to get their identification. They did that. In addition, in addition to that, I, I, the, both of the police officers who actually initially made the stop said, we weren't threatened. The woman who approached both the driver and the passenger was asked, did you feel threatened at that point? No, I did not feel threatened. The sergeant who was backing her up said, 
everything went along normally. They they were courteous. It was a it was a there was nothing unusual about uh, about this stop. Well, if if they and had the, the judge, if they had probable cause to arrest, yes. If they had probable cause to arrest, they could conduct a search that would have been permissible in an arrest, right? If it, in, in, yes, a in, search incident. Okay, into and an one arrest. of the things they could have done was to ask f for their names and addresses. I had, there was, it was never contested that they had the right to uh, ask uh, and, for names and, and that's addresses. what they were looking for. That's what the police yes. were looking for. Yes. Okay. Well, it, I mean, and, it strikes me whether there's probable cause or reasonable cause. The issue is the pat-down search. I mean, I, if there's probable cause or reasonable cause, in my view, in any event, the officers had a right to ask them to step out of the car. But the next question is the one you're just raising. Did they have a right or a basis to pat search the individual, right? Well, it, it's, it's the same standard. And I wanted to just to finish my, my previous sentence, which bears exactly yeah. on this, Your Honor. The, the judge accepted the testimony of the police officers that, that, there, was, that there was no danger. Mm -hmm. And for a pat frisk, you need, the, you need da danger also. So, but uh, not if it's incident to an arrest. Which this not is not. If it's, which not, if it's, not if it's incident to an arrest, well, but it's not incident to an arrest. asking us to extend the concept of incident to an arrest, it seems to me, to extend it to incident to probable cause to arrest. And, and I think they're asking us to make a jump that it isn't as long as there's probable cause to arrest, whether or not you arrest becomes irrelevant, and you can search the defendant even if the arrest never occurs. That's what the Commonwealth is asking us to do, right? That's what the Commonwealth is. That's a big step. At least possibly. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure of the argument, because if you look at the, at the Commonwealth's argument in the brief, the, the very first <coughs> case that's cited is Gonsalves, which has to do with, with traffic stops. And, uh, and if, if but I that can, has danger, but that's, that's based that on danger, danger, and everybody is, is in danger. The judge took that away. The judge took danger away. And I, and I would point out that um, in the, just to, as, as a final comment, in the major cases where the SJC made its, made its ruling that um, in all cases where there's a leg legitimate uh, a stop, the police officers may order the occupants out of the, out of the cars. Those cases both involved, I don't think they necessarily had to, but both involved this question, this issue of, of danger. In MIMS, the officer at least said, well, that was my policy to get people out of the car because there was danger. In Wilson, there was all of this extreme nervousness and, and uh, something else, ev evasiveness and uh, furtive actions. So I'm suggesting that, that, this is, that, this is, that, that that would suggest that this is not the, the, the case for the court to consider a change in, the, in, in either Gonzalez, Gonzalez or Vasquez. Thank you, Ms. O'Brien. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honors. Mr. Shea. Good morning. My name is Matthew Shea. I represent the Commonwealth. I was also trial counsel in this case. Um, let me ask you the question yes. I just asked the defense counsel. Uh, my reading of your brief is that you're actually asking us the, que the issue is search incident to arrest, and you're really saying it, it now becomes search incident to probable cause to arrest, and that um, you're saying that if there's probable cause to arrest, you can search the defendant even if the arrest never occurs, as long as it, it, it becomes a search incident to probable cause. I would suggest not every time, but in these facts and in similar facts where the policy, the statutory policy of the search in incident to arrest applies, that is destruction of evidence and officer safety. Uh, for example, if you choose There's not no to officer safety here, right? I, I disagree, Your Honor. Well, I mean, you, no, you're appealing that. There is no subjective fear on the officer's part. I think that's what the motion judge found. But the standard is the reasonable person, which is the appropriate standard. You don't want to yeah. just send in your least brave officer for every search so it can be justified. Uh, or you don't want the foolhardy officer to be unprotected because well, It's a reasonable police officer. It's a reasonable police right. officer. Well, so what is the evidence here that, that there was danger to a reasonable police officer so, based on everything that occurred? There's a lot that occurred here, Your Honor. Okay. It was uh, as you heard from, uh, or as the, the evidence is from Trooper Babin, Garofalo was involved in organized crime. This started out as an investigation involving the sale of large-scale heavy construction equipment, um, backhoes worth tens of thousands of dollars. Well, how, how many times can you actually 
let's say there's a six-year statute of limitations. How many times during that six years can you stop somebody based on former probable cause to arrest? I, I think it's going to be fact-specific, but probably... An unlimited number of times? In a practical matter, probably not more than once or twice. For example, Washington here was not arrested formally, I don't think, until months later. Yet they had that probable cause but, for five But different months. police officers could come and, and, and arrest somebody an unlimited number of times, couldn't they, under not this theory? Search. Search. Or, uh, search. Probable cause right. to stop them. They could do that an unlimited number of times. Which I think would be unreasonable under the Constitution. But, uh, but I mean... <laughs> how many times could you arrest a person for probable cause for a particular crime? Once. Right. Aren't you stretching this? Well, I would suggest that when you have a legitimate investigatory technique here, in these situations, you want an ongoing investigation not to be compromised. When a police officer has a, a reason to believe that there may be some danger to that police officer when approaching this individual, that it would be reasonable and proper to engage in a, a search. So now, arrest him. That's one possibility. But, for example... Well, well th that may be your only possibility, and, and you didn't avail yourself of it, or at least the police. That's correct. Because you, you, there still is a, a warrant requirement. And, right. and, and one of the exceptions is a search incident to an arrest. There was no arrest here. Right. There, in fact, the crime, the police weren't wrestling the guy down like they did in, in Cibron versus New York or Peters versus New York or, or even in Cup versus Murphy. This, this wasn't a, a circumstance where the police were actually apprehending the criminal during the course of the crime. So if you don't have search incident to an arrest, what are the exigencies? That's the other exception to the warrant requirement. Well, you have the vehicle, which is the exigency here. And I, I would suggest that aside from the search well, that might have given Well, that might have given you a basis to search the vehicle, which you did not do. Right. The only thing at issue here, as far as I can see, is the pad search. I mean, you had reasonable suspicion, probable cause, one of those things, to make the stop, to ask some questions, I think to even ask them to get out of the car. This isn't a typic, tripic, typical traffic stop. Um, but the question is whether you had a basis to pat search, because everything fall, falls from the pat search, does it not? The pat search resulted in the defendant taking the roll of money out of his pocket and saying, oh, this is what that is, it's $2,400. That's the whole issue. Yes. Whether that evidence itself is admissible be, uh, based on a, re, on a pat search that was legal. And I would suggest there are two more narrow reasons and justifications than the motion judge gave that would justify those searches. One is the, as you indicated, the reasonable suspicion, uh, and even the Gonsalves, even if this were to be looked at in that, in that sense, given what the officers knew at the time when they stopped Mr. Washington and Mr. Thomas, they knew they had just participated in a felony, uh, a felony that involves well, not, as guns. Just as Justice Spina said, arrest them. But even, even in, in a situation where there's no arrest, Your Honor, where they, where they don't have probable cause for arrest, they had a reasonable Wait, suspicion here. To stop, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Reasonable suspicion to stop, to ask questions, to seize them momentarily for purposes of that, yes. and to pat them down if right. there was a risk of danger. Right. And that's the whole issue. Is there a risk of danger where the, the motion judge found there was no danger? And, uh, well, the, the motion judge found there was no subjective uh, fear on the officers, I believe the, the, the record would show. And what did he find? Um, I mean, I, you know, I was looking at his findings, very good findings dictated from the bench, but uh, did he make any other findings? No, you I know, think... I mean, about uh, on, the, um, on the danger? Only that I think the defendants both behaved properly, politely, and appropriately. So what's the danger? The danger is that they had just committed a felony prior before, and they probably had evidence of that felony on their persons when they were confronted by the what's police. The what's the what's danger? What's that a danger? How's that well, a danger? Well, there's an inherent danger with uh, drug cases. As Here he is. The cases I've cited in the brief show that often firearms and other, other weapons are uh, associated with drug cases. Trooper Babin specifically testified in this case, in this motion, that he personally had experienced violence in these investigations, and that typically, and as, I, as you know, this is not just a, a drug investigation. This was an organized crime. This was a larceny of large, of, uh, large but, equipment. But don't you need sp specific articulable facts that, that a gun was, or some kind of a weapon was, was at hand? Yes. And, and what were they? Well, there was a bulge in... in yeah, but that was after he got out of the car. Yes. And I think we've established that there is reasonable suspicion, to, I, I would argue, to get him out of the car. And, and for the safety, when a felony has just been committed, committed and their police are confronting him, Mr. Washington had no identification. It was 9.30 at night. They didn't know exactly who they were dealing with, which is why they wanted the identification. And they had just committed 
a felony that night, and as you know, Mr. Thomas, they had probable cause to believe he committed it a month earlier, that this was an ongoing conspiracy of not just the drug case but with other tentacles. And in Gonsalves, the uh, court indicated it does not take much for a police officer to establish a reasonable basis to justify a search. And that's just in a motor vehicle stop. Here, we have much more than that. How do you get around the judge's finding, though, that there was, there was, no, there, there was no reasonable uh, basis to believe that there was a weapon? I, 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 didn't, didn't the judge I, find that there was no, no basis to, for the officers to feel that they were unsafe? Yeah, I'll read. The judge said there's nothing throughout this interaction between the troopers and Mr. Washington um, and the troopers and Mr. Thomas that made this, the troopers or any of them feel threatened. Nothing specific, nothing that was done to make them feel threatened. Yes. That's sort of the finding. And, and in but that but you're saying the prior history yes. does that. Yes, and the interaction itself, as, as described by numerous witnesses, was professional was one word that was used. I think cordial was another word. There was nothing within the motor vehicle stop aspect of this, that if this was just a motor vehicle stop, we would concede that they probably would not have a reason to ask these individuals out of the car. But it's the whole history of a felony being just committed, a felony that's associated with violence, with handguns, and is you know, enumerated in numerous cases in the courts, that a reasonable police officer in that situation would feel appropriate. H have we that. ever said that the destruction of evidence would be a valid basis? Yes. Just by itself? The, dis the destruction of evidence within, that's one of the reasons for a search incident to arrest. And it's also within, I think, Cup v. Mercy, Murphy when they, they didn't have probable cause to arrest, but they did notice the fingernail evidence was, was going to be necessary to preserve. So they had an exigency, they had probable cause to be that evidence may be being destroyed, and so they were allowed to seize it. But what's the evidence of, pro where is the probable cause in this case that Washington and Thomas still had drugs on them? I don't know that it had to be drugs, Your Honor. Or he still had anything on him that was illegal. $2,400. No, the $2,400. They had the evidence, evidence of the I crime. see. They had just given $2,400. Was, were they marked bills? They were not. <laughs> but it was $2,400. Uh, and I, I, see I it turned out I, exactly I, I, I don't see why we're complicating this so much. If there was probable cause to arrest these two people for a conspiracy to engage in drug trafficking and actually engaging in drug tra trafficking, there's no constitutional right to be arrested when they stop you. Why, why, is, why can't we just have this pat down, pat frisk, so on, as a search incident to probable cause to arrest? Well, you get the question that Justice Spina raised, how many times can you have a search? You don't have to worry about that question because this is the first time. That in this case, that, that, that's exactly the situation. And I would suggest if there are other times after this, you might not. Oh, well, that's a different case. It's a different case. That's so you're saying case. that there is, there is such a thing as another exception, not only search incident to an arrest, but another exception to the warrant requirement of search incident to probable cause for arrest. I've never heard of that one before, frankly. Well, as, as my sister mentioned in Skia, that was the exact uh, issue they were going at because they had a situation where okay. the officer acted reasonably and, in fact, l acted in a limited manner, didn't go as far as he could have in Skia of making an arrest and let, let him go. Yes. And they said, goodness, he had probable cause, he searched, found something, but didn't arrest actually acted in a limited, reasonable fashion, but we can't find an enumerated exception that would allow that. So we're going to say if you have probable cause, and uh, we're not going to turn the Fourth Amendment on its head to almost... Uh, probable know, cause to do what? Probable cause to, to search. search? To search. There was probable cause to search in that case, and was there another factor? The exigency of the vehicle. I, well, exactly. There's no exigency here. Where's the exigency? Well, if the police officers didn't search and... and applied for a warrant, these two individuals are gone and that twenty. So you're saying you're, so you're saying that the officer was not pat searching for weapons. He was actually searching the person for money. I'm saying he would have been, he was pat searching for weapons. Right. So that's the issue, whether there was a pat search, whether there was a basis for a pat search. Right. Although if you are uh, allowed to search, I would suggest if you're legally allowed to search, you'd certainly be legally allowed to pat. And well, I'm just suggesting what about other jurisdictions? Have any did, other did, jurisdictions adopted this concept of search incident to probable cause to arrest? The Maryland case, which is cited, I believe, in the defendant's brief, State v. Evans, touched upon it, where it was a similar situation where the police were not going to arrest. They had probable cause. They gathered the individuals up to take the identifying in information, but let them go, a sweep-type situation where you're doing a long-term investigation. And I believe the court upheld that type of 
uh, search. Well, hasn't, hasn't the Supreme Court said in Cibran versus New York, and I'm quoting, a search incident to a lawful arrest may not precede the arrest and serve as part of its justification? Right. What is found during a search cannot back you know, back a search, you, if you're going to, if the authority, if you're saying that, that the authority to search incident to an arrest, you have to have arrested the guy. That's what the Supreme Court said. Yes, and that, that's correct. If you're analogizing to it, there, there, there's one way. But this was not a search incident to arrest because there was no arrest. That's so you're correct. saying you argued below that this, that the, the pat down, which you say now was actually a search for money, was... There was probable cause to search, and there was exigency. That's what you argued below. That's yes. what you argued below? There, there, there's reasonable suspicion yeah. and, and uh, danger. Oh, da danger or exigency? Which is the one that you argued below? At, at the motion, it was both. We said, look, there's reasonable suspicion to, to do a Terry stop here yeah. and danger, and there was also uh, probable cause here to arrest them and, and the warrant. The, so uh, where's exigency? It was exigency. Oh, Your Honor, we had a right to pat search him because it was an exigency here. He might have left with the money in his That's pocket. That's correct. But he did That's leave you with are. the money. He did leave I, with the money. That's right. So, so you, how can you rely on that as an exigency? Because the police officers took less liberties with the defendant than they were allowed to. And so for the, the remedy to be the use of the exclusionary rule to to somehow... It's a sham, isn't it? No, it's an investigation, ongoing investigation. It's a sham, and, yeah, well... I, I, I would suggest, Your Honor, that the police had three reasons, to, three justifications to have this search upheld. Uh, the motion judge found the broadest sense to justify it, that is, if you have probable cause you can, uh, to arrest you, you can search. Uh, you, they also had reasonable suspicion, uh, and a reasonable safety fear based on the prior felonies. They also had probable cause to search for evidence of the crime, plus the exigency, that being the vehicle, or that to go away. So and did you argue that below? That's all I want to know, that I, there was probable cause to search and there was exigency which justified the search. I argued the reasonable, uh, the, the reasonable suspicion. I don't know that I argued probable cause to search. But uh, as you know, of course, this court does not have to follow the motion judge reasonings or, or my reasonings below in my argument. Um, so I, I would just suggest that with respect to this case, and, and the, the, this case mirrors the Mantinez case, which I've cited in my brief, where the police see somebody or individuals who are engaged in, in a felony, drug felony that's associated with violence, that has a minimum mandatory sentence, that has a maximum sentence of 20 years. Um, we recognize the seriousness in that in the bail statute and that the risk of flight uh, can be thought of when looking at bail. Here there's a risk of flight as well when police are intercepting those individuals going through um, uh, leaving a scene of, of a felony when, a, when looking at the situation. Given that there's a reasonableness to frisk them, that there's probable cause to search them, and that there's probable cause to arrest them, that the actions of the police here were not unreasonable either under the federal constitution or our constitution, and that the exclusionary rule that the defendant seeks is not the appropriate remedy, and I would urge you to uh, uphold the convictions below. Thank you, Mr. Shea. We'll take a short break. Thank you.